Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCullum, and I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House up in Maine, taking a look at some of the magnificent German sniper rifles that they are going to be selling in their upcoming April firearms auction in 2017. This, of course, is the HK PSG-1, and that stands for, translated into English, Precision, Precision Sharpshooter's Rifle. There was actually an SG-1 version of the G3 rifle that preceded this. That was the Scharfschützengewehr, the Sharpshooter's Rifle, or the Marksman's Rifle. This was distinguished from it by being the Precision Marksman's Rifle. This is a true sniper rifle. It was designed for police operations rather than the military, which is part of why it has a tripod instead of a bipod. And this is another one of the rifles, like the Walther 2000, that came out of the Munich, the, the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre. If you're not aware, this was, of course, a terrorist attack on the Munich Olympics, which resulted in a bunch of civilians, Olympic athletes, being taken hostage. The German police response was unfortunately inadequate and resulted in the death of all of the terrorists, but also the death of a great many hostages as well. The issue at hand was the German police department didn't really have a dedicated counterterrorism task force. They had guys with rifles who weren't bad, but weren't ready to be set up at night with iron sights hundreds of yards away from hostages intermingled with targets. So, uh, and part of the issue here is the German constitution prohibited the use of the military on German soil. So they couldn't or weren't able to call in uh, German military snipers. They had the police and whatever the police had on hand. Now, in the aftermath of this, uh, a number of things were taken to prevent it from ever happening like that again, and one of them was the development of GSG-9. This is the German Counterterrorism Special Force, and GSG-9 is actually a part of the German uh, Border Security Division. Uh, it is not actually part of the German military, specifically so that it can uh, be used on German soil should there ever be another incident like the Munich attack. At any rate, one of the things that uh, Munich made very clear is that a, a unit like GSG-9 was going to need a very precise sniper's rifle. Um, the, the engagement at, in the Munich incident was at several hundred meters. Iron sights aren't going to cut it. And for that kind of work, you really do want a really good sniper rifle. This isn't typical police work, or that wasn't typical police work, where you know, an ordinary police sniper is rarely going to make a shot at more than 50 or 100 meters. For this sort of of uh, capability they wanted a lot more. Hence the PSG-1. So this is obviously based on the German G3 rifle, but a number, in fact a significant number of changes have been made to it. This is not just a G3 with a, a fancy trigger and a scope, which is I think what a lot of people may expect. There are a lot of changes, what look like minor changes inside the gun to the mechanics that really contribute it contribute to it being a magnificently accurate rifle. This is a half minute of angled gun with good ammunition. It just is, out of the factory. And that's a pretty rare thing. Now, of course, it has a price tag to match. You know, when these were new, they were $10,000 rifles. But that's the price, in many ways, of getting a rifle that is fine-tuned enough to do this, to, to get that level of accuracy. I think there are a lot of people who underestimate what kind of work it really takes to get that level of repeatable precision from a semi-automatic rifle. It is interesting that, like the Walther 2000, and I, I have a video up on one of those as well, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely take a look at it. Like that, there are a number of choices on this rifle that, in retrospect, look really old-fashioned to us. And the biggest one is the scope. These rifles came with a Hensoldt 6x42 power scope. It's good glass, but it's the only option you had. There are no rings on this rifle. The scope is actually fixed to a pair of scope mounts that are welded to the receiver by a pair of bolts. So you can remove the scope if you need to, but unless you find another scope that's made with these specific threaded attachment points at this specific spacing, you can't change the scope. You don't get an option. You can't go to, say, a higher magnification scope or a variable magnification scope or something that has a more fancy reticle in it. The reticle here is just a simple crosshair. It has a BDC out to 600 meters, and that's all you get. It's a very simplistic scope by today's standards. 
Uh, it does have a lit reticle. Um, there's a, a, and a brightness adjustment and a button, and apparently, and I don't have a battery in this one, but apparently you hit the button and it illuminates the reticle for two minutes and then it goes off again. Well, that's a, it's an interesting system. Certainly prevents it from being left on all the time and draining the battery. But apparently they did have trouble with the batteries not being all that reliable. Figures they'd go to all the work, get a fantastic rifle, and the batteries aren't quite up to par. At any rate, batteries are only necessary to illuminate the reticle, not to actually use anything here. So, so a tripod. Really? Would it have killed them to add a bipod? Well, they sort of did. They have an allowance for a bipod. There is a rail here on the bottom of the handguard, which allows you to mount a sling, uh, or a sling swivel if you want one, but also allows you to mount a bipod. That wasn't included OEM, but a lot of people have done it. This particular rifle, in fact, has a bipod stud on it, and it does come with a short Harris bipod. That being said, though, the tripod really does make good sense for the role that this rifle was intended for. This is something that you're going to go out and put in an in-place position, and you're probably going to be watching your target for some period of time before you actually take a shot. And the tripod allows you to really set this thing in a perfect position and be more stable than a bipod. The way this is designed, you have a tensioning screw here. When I loosen that up, I can then crank this bipod up or down. There is a rubber coating, a rubber half ring inside here that sets nice and gently with the, uh, the rifle's forend and does prevent it from sliding. You can move it, but it's not gonna slip around like hard plastic on hard plastic. And then we have this lever back here which, when loosened, allows the front support to pivot side to side and then can be tightened in place. This is important because the length of the legs is not adjustable. So if you set this up on uneven ground, you would then use this to level out the rifle, lock it in place, and then set your height. To actually assemble the bipod, or to take it down, there is a center screw here. We're going to loosen that up, and then all three of the legs simply come out. And that is the bipod as it packs up into the carry case. To assemble it, quick and easy, just drop all three legs in, tighten the center screw down, and then you're all set. Even the tripod is just incredibly German. You'll notice that the, the tips, the little pointed feet, are beveled, they're at an angle, and that angle is set precisely so that on a flat surface, all three of the legs will sit on this flat surface and not sit on their pointy tips. So you don't wear the tips of the tripod legs out. Then of course you do have those pointy tips if you have a more uh, a soft and pliable surface and you've got the collars on here to prevent the legs from sinking in. The amount of engineering that went into just the tripod for the PSG-1 is by itself pretty remarkable. Now the rifle itself of course, on the magazine well, we have standard HK markings, which are, of course, PSG-1. Serial number here is D91. Uh, and, of course, the caliber is 7.62 NATO. The examples that were imported into the U.S. will have an import marking on the right side of the magazine well, made in Germany, and then in in imported by HK USA in Virginia. Now let's look at some of the mechanical changes that were made to the rifle. And one of the most significant mechanical ones is... This. This is called a silent bolt closing device, and it is basically a forward assist from an AR-15. You'll notice scalloped cuts in the bolt carrier there. Those engage with a ratchet in this, and the idea for that is it does allow you to slowly ride the bolt home. On a, on a G3 type rifle, this can be a bit of an issue because at the very end of travel you have to engage the locking lugs, and that's something that Normally, you don't want to just slowly run the bolt forward on a G3, or it won't engage. It won't go into battery. So, if I run the bolt to there, now I can push this forward and drop the bolt. I'm not sure about the silent part. I think in order for it to be silent, you'd kind of have to ride your thumb on this wedge and hold it down and make sure it goes even slower because these tend to snap uh, audibly into, into battery when they do lock up. But that's a major, major mechanical element added specifically to the PSG-1 with the idea of it allowing you to be sneaky and quiet when you're in a sniping position. 
The trigger is another obvious change. Um, maybe not so obvious from the outside, but it has this shoe added to the bottom to give you a nice wide trigger surface. The main changes to the trigger are internal, so we'll take a look at that in a moment. I will point out, however, that it is a latch on. There's no pin on the trigger mechanism, which is nice. That helps it avoid machine gun uh, issues related to HK in the United States. And the buttstock here is fairly distinctive. Now, this is a style of buttstock that has been pretty well copied uh, here in the US, and now you can find all manner of uh, fully adjustable stocks that look like this for your AR-15 or most any other rifle. However, in the early 70s, this wasn't a real common thing, and this was a really nice high-level feature on a, a precision rifle like the PSG-1. So the length of pull and the height of the comb are both adjustable. You actually have this tool that comes with the rifle, and we have square adjustment uh, pegs in the gun. So I'm going to put that in, and then I can loosen it up. And now I can run the buttstock out or all the way in. When I get it to the right position, I can then tighten this down, lock it in place. This does also allow you to cant the, the buttstock just slightly to one side or the other, if you decide that you want to. Then, in theory, you can leave this in the gun if you want to, because it does have this little retaining clip, or you can leave it in your carry case. We have the same thing up here for the adjustable riser. Put that in, and when I loosen it, this is under spring tension, so it's going to snap all the way up. I will then put it to whatever position I want, tighten it back up, and take the adjustment tool out. As you can tell by the name here, the scope is a Hensoldt, 6x42, specifically made for the PSG-1, as you can see from PSG-1 being in the model designation there. We have windage adjustment, obviously for zeroing, and then we have a combination of elevation adjustment and a bullet drop compensator. So you can adjust the, the set range for whatever you are shooting at. The PSG-1 does take all standard G3 or HK-91 magazines. Uh, the carry case set that these were originally sold with, includes a couple fives and a couple twenties. Now, let's go ahead and take this apart, because some of the significant changes are on the inside. It's going to disassemble just like a standard HK-91. I'll put the pins. This is very tight. Oh, before I do that, actually, I should point out there are a pair of stiffening bars that have been welded to the receiver. Uh, this is, you know, the, the G3 series does use a simple uh, stamped sheet metal receiver, which is prone to quite a lot of flex. So adding these bars helps to stabilize the receiver. That's an important upgrade for accuracy. All right, buttstock assembly comes off. This is pretty much normal. Now our trigger group is going to pivot down and off. and the bolt carrier, bolt and bolt carrier come out the back. So the stiffening bars have been added to the receiver, the forward assist has been added to the receiver, the trunnion is larger to help accommodate the larger heavy barrel in there, that's uh, about a 0.88 inch in diameter barrel, 25.6 uh, inch length on the barrel. And of course we have these two permanent scope mounts uh, on the receiver. So really actually a substantial number of changes, upgrades, and uh, modifications made to the receiver unit itself. Looking at the internals, we have a number of changes to the bolt carrier as well. So I have a commercial G3 import rifle, um, semi-auto rifle actually, bolt and bolt carrier here as a comparison. Uh, most distinctively, we have the thumb pad and the serrations for the forward assist here on the, the bolt carrier tube. And then looking at the front of the bolts, you can see a substantial difference in the extractors. This is the PSG-1 extractor, this is the G3. So the G3 has a much larger extractor, actually, but it's also a different design of extractor. You can see it's a, a piece here under a tension spring that comes straight back into the bolt. On the PSG-1, the extractor wraps around the bolt 
and has a spring underneath it on that side. So presumably this is this has been probably changed in order to specifically get a more repeatable purchase on the case uh, while not sacrificing any reliability of extraction. And one of the most significant changes is to the rollers. Now, an original standard G3, you'll notice I can shake this and the roller will come out the side and the rollers spin, being, you know, rollers. And this is a very efficient, simple piece to make. It works really well. However, what this means is that you don't have a totally consistent lockup because from shot to shot, that roller can rotate, which means you're going to be locking on a different section of the roller at any given time. That's just fine for a combat rifle that needs to be two or three or four minute of angle accurate. That's fine, it's cheap, it's easy to make, but it's not gonna cut it for the PSG-1. If we look at the rollers here, I can't get them to come out of the bolt when it's not in battery. And we can see why if I snap it into battery. Now, you'll notice that these rollers are not actually circular. They have a flat surface on the front. The purpose of that is to prevent them from actually rolling. What you want to do, the, the idea here, is that they will always engage at the exact same spot. You'll never have an inconsistent wear pattern causing the gun to lock up differently uh, between different shots. Now, one of the well-known features of the G3 is that it has a kind of mediocre trigger. It's got a long, heavy, creepy trigger pull that is intentional. That was done to uh, allow the rifle to pass a pretty severe drop test without firing inadvertently. And that's, again, fine for a combat rifle, but it's not going to cut it for a PSG, a precision marksman's rifle. Now, the PSG-1 grip assembly has a number of changes made to it. It has this trigger shoe, which is adjustable up and down and for angle and however you prefer it. it has a nice thick grip, uh, very wide, fills out the hand, and it has this adjustable palm rest. Go up and down, wherever, wherever you prefer to have that. It is semi-automatic only. Of course, being a sniper's rifle, there's no need for this to be full auto. But most importantly, it has a really good trigger. It has a very crisp, roughly three pound trigger. How do they do that? Why don't they do that? in all the G3s. Well, the reason they do it, don't do it in all of them is because I expect the PSG-1 will not pass the kind of military drop test that the standard G3 will, and it doesn't need to. But here's another interesting element. Note that when the hammer is cocked, it comes to rest there. The standard G3 does not. Now, if you were going to take a G3 trigger and, poly and, and tune it up, you can do that, and you can reduce the trigger weight, and you can reduce the trigger creep, but you are, you're changing two things. You are either uh, losing uh, engagement surface on the sear, which leaves the guns potentially liable to double fire, or you're reducing the spring weight, which leaves the guns potentially liable to light strikes. You know, if you have less force on the hammer, you're going to have less force on the trigger, but if you have too little, it won't reliably fire and not reliably firing would be a major problem in a sniper's rifle. So how do we fix that? The answer is they've redesigned the trigger so it actually has a two-stage hammer spring. Uh, the initial stage back here has relatively little spring tension on it, which means the trigger pull is quite light and very crisp. However, as soon as the, the hammer gets to here, a secondary spring kicks in and runs that thing forward with a lot more force. That is there primarily to prevent light strikes. If the whole hammer were, were running with just this spring tension, it would be a very unreliable rifle. By having that second stage, and it's light, 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 and whoop, right there, you can hear it snap when it engages. That, is, that booster effect makes this a very special trigger group and allows it to do what it, it allows it to be both reliable and a very nice trigger. This thing has really stood the test of time remarkably well. The Walther 2000, we see, we see places where it's it's kind of obvious that that it's outdated. The PSG1, with the exception of the scope options, which by the way were updated in 2006, they released the PSG1 A1 version, which does allow you to change out scopes, as well as having a couple other minor tweaks, like the charging handle is mounted a little bit lower so that it doesn't interfere with the scope when you try to lock it open. 
at any rate, the, the PSG-1 has really withstood the test of time well, and it is every bit as magnificent of a sharpshooter's rifle today as it was when it came out, which is a pretty remarkable achievement on the part of HK. If you'd like to own this one, uh, there aren't a whole lot in the United States, and boy, this would be a sweet shooting rifle. Uh, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to the Julia catalog page on this rifle, where you can see their complete pictures, uh, description, provenance, etc., etc. And if you're interested, you can participate in the auction live here in Maine or uh, place a bid over their website. Thanks for watching.